All right. So, hi. I'm uh, Jason. I don't have any slides, just forewarning. Um, so, going to chat with you guys, like I said, about ships and whales. So, we're going to talk about Docker and Kubernetes. Um, so, first thing, show of hands, how many of you have heard of Docker? How many of you guys are using Docker? How many of you are using Docker in production? How many of you guys know Kubernetes? How many of you guys are using Kubernetes in production? <laughs> one hand. <laughs> All right. Wow, we weeded them out fast on that one. All right. So I have a confession to make. Um, the first time I wrote Node was today. I started at about 16 today. Um, so please, dear God, forgive me. My code is probably terrible. You're all going to hate me. But I used Express, and I heard that that's good. So hopefully that gives me some brownie points. So um, the first thing is a quick overview of our application. Can you guys all see that? Is that big enough for you? The right. Yes. We'll, we'll just ignore the left side for now. I'll tell you what files we're navigating to. Hopefully, you'll be able to figure it out. So this here is a Docker file. Hopefully, based on the hands, most of you guys have seen one of these before. And it's pretty basic. I'm actually not using best practices. You can see I've been using Docker for too long and used the maintainer label still instead of using a proper label. But hey, sorry. Um, basically, all I'm doing is copying in or creating a work directory that I'm operating from, copying in my stuff. I run a yarn install. I expose 3000, because apparently that's like the normal node port. And I tell it when it starts to run npm serve. It's all pretty basic stuff. I have this horrible package json thing that does a bunch of stuff. Most of it doesn't matter. I think the only thing that actually matters in this is this particular line right here, because all of this I totally copy-pasted from something else that I had worked on in the past. So what we actually do in the server, we're just serving a couple of endpoints. Most important endpoint for me is this guy. How many of you are familiar with health Z and ready Z? or health and readiness endpoints. All right, so there's like three. Most important endpoint that you can have in any application is going to be health Z for somebody like me. I don't work as a developer. I work as a platform engineer. I run the Kubernetes platform that has served other companies before, and now I'm here at Figo to bring them into the modern era to run everything on Kubernetes. One of the things that Kubernetes needs to know is if your application is healthy. If your application is unhealthy, it's going to do something beautiful. A beautiful thing that it's going to do that we haven't done in the past. Most of you guys, I'm assuming, set up a VM to run stuff on in production or maybe you use Docker and containers to run stuff, but you probably like just restart a container. Kubernetes doesn't. Kubernetes is like honey badger. It just don't give a fuck. So it's just going to walk over, and it's going to shoot your container, and it's going to make a new container to replace it. Everything in Kubernetes ideally should be stateless. If there is any state that should be stored, it needs to be stored outside of the container. The way that it knows whether your application is healthy or not is, A, it watches the process to see if that process is still alive in the container, and B, it will do a health check. Common convention says we use slash health Z as the health check. You can configure that as you wish. But it will only keep your container alive if that says, hey, I'm healthy. Very important. Easy way to say I'm healthy, return 200. If you don't have any complex dependencies that you rely on, 
if you don't know if your application is broken or not internally, return 200. And then I know, as Kubernetes, if your application is alive or dead. More interestingly, I mean, you guys write Node, so it's relatively fast, and you don't have a lot of dependencies. If you're writing Java, for example, I've had the pleasure, we'll call it, in some of my Kubernetes clusters running Java applications that take over 20 minutes to restart or to start up before they're actually ready to serve traffic. That makes them horribly ineffective if you start adding them to the load balancers right away to be able to serve traffic. That's where ReadyZ, or the readiness endpoint, comes into play, is now your application has a way of telling the Kubernetes or whatever you happen to be using, yes, I am ready to accept traffic. I have everything that I need to do my work. And I return 200 now, and I can get traffic. If you don't return a 200, it, the instance doesn't get any traffic. And all of a sudden, you don't have you know, maybe 50% of your load going to an instance that isn't ready yet. So just something to be aware of. So we've got a couple of fun and interesting things here. And then, is this making sense to everyone first? Everybody on board so far? Awesome. So like I said, we've got these cute little apps. So I've got a front-end server, same kind of thing. All it does is serve an index.html. And I've got a media server, which theoretically serves stuff from slash uploads, which in slash uploads, we have this fantastic monkey. Bears resemblance. I think it might be my brother. So what we are going to do now is I cannot. It's impossible. Actually, maybe literally I cannot. <laughs> ah, there we go. Whew. I was terrified for a moment there. This is a very new system for me. Uh, I just installed Ubuntu 18.4 and it broke everything. So I was running Arch before that. Everything was always broken. That's the difference. <laughs> So what we're going to do, I'm in the uh, media server here. I'll just back out and go to the front end server. And we'll do a quick Docker build. Uh, and we'll tag it to FE server. And we're doing the fantastic build. Do, 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 do. Apparently, I took a little while. And it's doing its fun, exciting thing of building stuff. Now, as I mentioned, today is the first time I've ever done anything with Node um, as far as writing any of the code. I'm a Golang guy. Golang and Node have a very interesting history. Just like to point out, just to do the language wars thing, that the creator of Node has said that if you want to write an API, do it in Golang. As a result of that, I really didn't want to install Node and NPM and all of those kind of fun things on my computer. So I just built this fantastic Node thing, but I don't have Node at all on my computer. I don't have this Node package manager thing with the exciting teapots going on. I don't have to worry about my system getting infected with all of that excitingness. I, but I still get all of the advantages to be able to do the stuff that I want to do with Node. And even though I have code sitting on my machine, and even though I need to build that code, I don't have to have Node on my machine anymore. I don't have to worry about it. And if I want to get rid of Node so that it doesn't infect my machine any more than it already has. It's literally a Docker RMI, and I get rid of that image, and it no longer infects my machine. 
So, I know, I know. Bad form, right? Bad form. No, I mean, to be fair, Node does have its use cases, and it is very effective at doing some things that Golang sucks at. So, all, all things being fair. So, the m bigger point is, if I want to do anything with... If I have to do anything with Java, I don't have to put Java on my machine anymore. I don't have to put a JDK. I can literally just use it in a container, and it doesn't infect my machine with all of the Javaness. I love coffee. I hate Java. So that's... <laughs> um, so we've now got this fantastic little FE server container. And sure, I can go onto my machine and do a Docker run, and I can uh, map the ports to uh, see it, and what it was called, FE server. So now I've got this thing running, logs to six, and I can see that, hey, it's there, it's listening on 3000. Um, Please, dear God, uh, local host. I could curl, too. But hey, look, that's pretty. It's the index file. I don't want to curl an HTML page. Come on, man. It just looks messy. So there we go. I've got this fantastic thing. But now, what the hell do I do with it? How do I get it into production? So Docker RM. Force, what was it called? 26? 26. Good memory. It's too hot to remember things. So there we go. It's gone. So this is where things actually kind of start to get fun. So how many of you guys have ever had the opportunity to deploy an application to Kubernetes. Oh, wow. OK. I thought the number was going to be much, much higher than that. So uh, maybe I need to take a step back here. Thankfully, I prepared some, or semi-prepared some resources here. I hope to God that, uh, no, no, looking at too many things here. There we go. All right. So. Da, 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 da. Let's run through the concepts of Kubernetes. So the first thing is Kubernetes is declarative. You can't do anything imperatively in Kubernetes. Even when you do things that you think you're being imperative about, all you're actually doing is creating resources on the API. So everything in <coughs> Kubernetes is declarative, which is beautiful. And the whole thing is based around control loops. Control loops are used all over the place. Um, and the controller pattern is, is one of the most powerful things that you can use, especially in microservices. We've talked about that internally at Figo quite a bit. But it allows you to decouple your apps and not have to worry about serialization anymore or parallelism. It's so bloody convenient to allow you to decouple control structures. And all controller loops do. They're used in robotics all the time. Um, you know, if you look at, I've got one of those uh, drones, those DJI Mavic drones that you can fly around and it does a bunch of stuff. And it's got all of these computers on there and sensors, but all they're really doing is something really simple and really stupid. They're dumb. And I love dumb things that can be combined together to do awesome things, but dumb apps are fantastic. 500 lines of code, 1,000 lines of code to do something that on its own is boring and useless, which is what most of Kubernetes is at its core, and compose all of those things together to make a very highly intelligent, highly effective, scalable system. Um, control loops just go and do the same thing we do all the time. Current state, desired state, diff, resolve. Current state, desired state, diff, resolve. What is happening around me? 
What do I want to be happening around me? What's the difference between those two things? Do something to get me closer to that ideal state. We value simplicity over complexity. We're, there is a lot of complexity inherent to managing systems at the scale at which Google does, but still Kubernetes is understandable to me. I'm an idiot, so as my colleagues and other individuals will tell me, I mean, I just bashed Node at a Node meetup. You know I'm an idiot. So um, it's compatible with legacy applications as well. You might not know that. You might not be familiar with that. But you can literally run anything that you run in production today on Kubernetes. You might not leverage all of the advantages of Kubernetes, but you can most certainly run it inside Kubernetes today. Um, and it values the most importantly, cattle over pets. Like I said earlier, Kubernetes will walk around like honey badger and just don't give a fuck. It'll go and just shoot whatever it so feels. And so you have to architect your applications around that so that they can die. But it also means that you don't have to worry about these snowflakes anymore. You don't have snowflakes because everything's created from this same image, this same copy. So some of the concepts of Kubernetes, we'll just break it down real fast. I think I have my boot to do, do Yes. So we have a concept of masters and workers. Um, we're, this is slowly being changed to be called the control plane instead of masters, because a control plane doesn't necessarily have to run on segmented nodes. It can run inside the cluster for the most part. Um, in fact, most of the cluster implementations now for Kubernetes run the controllers and schedulers and API servers inside the Kubernetes cluster. The only thing that's really special is etcd. So the cool thing about Kubernetes is everything in this, with a, the exception of etcd, is stateless. There is zero state within any of the components in Kubernetes except for etcd. Everything that does need to be stored and is stateful gets stored through the etcd server, or sorry, through the API server to etcd. That is the only point of persistence. Those are the only pets that you have in your cluster. Even your applications inside the cluster become cattle. The only pet that you have is etcd, and you want to take care of it. Now, you have a concept of pods. So pods is basically an encapsulation around one or more containers. It's also an encapsulation around any volumes or data that gets mounted in. And it also is a wrapper around the namespace. So a pod gets its own IP. You can almost think of a pod as being something similar to a virtual machine. Similar. I'm going to have Kubernetes guys tracking me down any moment for saying that. But you can think of it pretty much the same way. It gets its own IP. It's its own box where you can run one or more things inside. So, <clears throat> And labels. Labels are what makes Kubernetes powerful. They're the only thing that makes Kubernetes powerful in and of itself. Everything is selected off labels. Everything is dictated off of labels. So you can have metadata that tells you how I'm going to route traffic around my cluster, and it's all just controlled by labels. So it allows you a lot of power. It allows you a lot of flexibility. It also allows you to shoot yourself in the foot relatively easily as well. So it's something that you should understand how labels work to be able to leverage them effectively. Um, we're going to skip over this real fast. Fast. Ah, service. So you have a pod. Pods need to get traffic. So you can think of these as like the container. I mentioned earlier that you need to have a ready Z. The ready Z maps to a service. So Kubernetes is constantly checking. And you never talk to a pod directly. You always talk to a service. All a service is is a virtual IP 
that is shared amongst all of your pods. We just use IP tables and route traffic. When you send it to that service IP, route it to any of the pods that happen to be available to serve that traffic. We know that they're available to serve that traffic based on that readiness endpoint. So one of the things you can do is if your service is getting a, an instance of your service, rather, is getting too much traffic, it can also go, OK, I'm not ready anymore. Let me satisfy the requests that I have now, deal with those, and then I can move on and come ready again once I've recovered from handling all of these requests. Maybe I'm working an infinite query that has come in on GraphQL, and I can go, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of things. Don't send me anything right now. I'm out. I can still keep working on that one particular problem, but I don't take any new requests, and therefore I'm not timing out any new requests that are coming, because they can go to this guy over here, and he doesn't have that infinite query. He can go ahead and handle it. Your question. So the question is, am I ever going to be killed if I'm not ready for a while? So no, Kubernetes will never kill you based on whether you're ready or not. You could be not ready ad infinitum, and Kubernetes is never going to kill you. It's also never going to send you traffic. It will only kill you if you go unhealthy or if your process dies. So, but good question for sure. If nobody's ready, you get whatever nobody is. So this is all done at layer three. So you'll get probably a conref because there's nothing there to listen. So that's, that's the most probable. If you're doing this at layer seven and it gets passed through, there's a thing called an ingress controller that handles all layer seven traffic ingress for the cluster. And that will usually return like a 503 um, and just say, hey, I don't have anybody to send you to, so go away, come back later. But, you know, in the case of this, because it is layer three, you'll basically probably just get a conref. What So the question is about sticky sessions or session persistence. So there's a couple of ways that it's dealt with. So if you open a connection to an instance, that connection for the duration of the connection is held to that single instance. Your, your traffic isn't going to be moved onto another correction. If that instance fails, you'll see that the connection is closed and, you know, or times out, and that's it. Um, however, if we're talking about layer seven and more of like the sticky sessions where I need to talk to the same web server or it's ideal for me to talk to the same web server, the most common implementation of the ingress controller is using Nginx. Kubernetes is a pluggable ecosystem. Ecosystem, let me try that again. Um, and so Nginx is the most popular uh, ingress controller it handles sticky sessions just fine, just like it normally would outside of Kubernetes. So HA proxy is another example of an ingress controller that does layer seven and can also do layer three ingress, and it can also handle sticky sessions as well. So, so the reverse proxy would sit in front of the service. You don't, so in Kubernetes, you've got this overarching, we'll pretend this gray box, is the concept of the cluster. You don't get to talk to the service as an external entity. You talk, you, theoretically you can, but that's way advanced and almost nobody does it. Usually you have some mode of ingress, whether that be an HA proxy that's sitting here on the edge that will ingress your traffic, or layer seven ingress as well, Nginx, Trafic, HA proxy, whatever, sitting at the edge 
and the ingressing of that traffic and then sending it over to that service. It, it is. I mean, all it is is a virtual IP, so you're just using, you know, best effort. Basically, it's just IP tables that's going to send it to whatever connections I happen to have available. It's not going to try and intelligently load balance anything, but it's load balancing inside of the cluster. It's not for load balancing coming on ingress to the cluster. So you had a question back there. Yes. Hell Z would be implemented in one of the containers. Okay. So one of the containers would respond with a slash health Z endpoint or another endpoint. Yes. Sure. Cool. So if it's a database, let's talk. MySQL, for example. Yeah, exactly. So there's a port check. There's three options within Kubernetes to do health checks. You can do a port check, which for MySQL is perfect. It will only open 3306 once it is ready to serve traffic. So you can just continue to use that as a readiness. And as, you can use it as a readiness. Uh, you wouldn't want to use it as a health because it will kill you as you're trying to come up. And if you're trying to come up and can't come up successfully and get killed during that process, that can potentially cause some issues with data. What you can also do is do an exec, where you run a command to check a PID, you run a command uh, you know, using MySQL CLI, and see, hey, you know, what's actually going on in the database? What is my state? And you can run literally a bash script if you want to check to see, hey, what's going on inside this container, inside this application? Is it up and is it ready? This is perfect for something like a Redis, where you might have a Redis slave that's still copying data. You can run an exec. You know, it it's probably has the port open, but it's still doing copies. You can now run an exec where you're asking the Redis instance, this slave instance, how far behind the master are you? How close to the master are you right now? And if you're not in sync with the master, then I'm not going to send any traffic to you until you're in sync. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, there, there are some ways that are specific to the Docker Swarm implementation that allow you to do that. Um, but basically, they are just metadata that's exposed around the container. The unfortunate part with that um, is that that isn't bound within what's called the Open Container Initiative, or OCI spec. Um, and as a result of that, the only thing that can leverage that currently is Swarm, because Kubernetes, Mesos, et cetera, they're abiding by that OCI spec. So they only care what's actually in the spec. This isn't in the spec. We aren't going to listen to it. We aren't going to pay attention to it. Because there are a lot of other implementations, things like Rocket or Run C or App C, et cetera, that don't have the ability to introspect that. And different container formats as well, like Rocket containers, where they don't provide that same type of metadata yet. So it's something I would love to see adopted into the spec, because then it pushes more onto you as the application developer to know how to check your application to see whether it's healthy or not. And that's the beauty of all of this, is this, like I said, I'm an ops guy. Most of you guys, I would assume, are developers. I'm dumb. I don't know a damn thing about your applications. I literally wrote Node for the first time today. I don't know a thing about how to deal with your applications, but if you give me a well-known endpoint or if you give me a way to introspect and ask your application, hey, are you all right? That gives me huge power, and that gives you huge power too, because 
Now I'm not guessing whether your application is working or not. I don't have to come to you and go, hey, your application is fucked up, man. It never works, it never runs, and it's just me doing something that you didn't expect. It makes it very simple now for us to communicate via these specifications, and I can run your application without ever meeting you, without ever knowing you, without ever knowing anything about your application, as long as you adhere to some very well-known standardized things. And that's the beauty of what the Docker file being able to expose that is, is that now you have this ability to introspect your application and define that as being metadata of part of this whole package, as it were. So, yes? Sorry, and just for clarification, you said there's a few different ways of fixing that problem. Yeah. Who's executing or who has the information about the document? Is it the service? Is it the pod? Like, who's running or, like, where is the command to say, this is the way that you check the health of the container? Where is that actually saved? So that's saved... That's a complex question. Sorry. Kuber yeah. Kubernetes, yeah. Kubernetes is relatively decomposed, but we'll, you know what, we'll jump back because that's a good question. So the controller, so first off, I push in my application to the API server. The, my manifests that define my application, which also includes where to check and how to check for health and how to check for readiness. Those get persisted into etcd. Then, these controllers go, hey, it's time there's a health controller, or technically it's a pod controller, that all it does is run a controller pattern. And as part of the controller pattern that it's doing, when it asks for what is the current state, for it to get the current state, it says, oh, I've got a health and readiness check here. I'm going to execute those. So it will go ahead and talk to these kublets, these are the things that actually are on the node and talk to Docker, and they'll say, hey, go do this thing. Whether it be doing an HTTP hit, whether it, or HTTP, HTTPS, whether it be a port hit, or whether it be an exec, the kublet is responsible for running that and persisting the result of that to the API server. Once that's persisted to the API server, or sent to the API server and persisted in etcd, I should say, then that pod controller will come back around and go, oh, yeah, hey, this health check succeeded. This readiness check succeeded. I can continue to send traffic here. I can continue to keep this alive. So, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, so the Mm -hmm. Each container has the ability to do a health check. Yes. Yeah, the kubelet talks to Docker to ask. Yeah. The whole pod gets kicked. Yeah. We we never recycle a container. We go, this is a unit of work. And you know, it, it's like saying, oh, this horse, oh, this is a good example. This horse has a broken leg. So I'm just gonna go and cut off its leg and try to put a new one on. We don't know if the inf you know, it breaking its leg has infected the rest of the things. So we just go, Better be safe than sorry. Let's just kill this one, and you know, hopefully, the other horses will have babies. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you could ask my colleagues. I'm not exactly a nice guy. <laughs> so, oh, and speaking of one of my colleagues, yes. How do we post-mortem this horse? So the beauty of this horse is after we've shot it, we still have the corpse, right? We still have the container sitting around. We still have the logs. We still have the ability to go and look at it. So and shooting basically means stopping. Sh shooting means removing in this instance. 
but it's a container. That's the beauty of the thing. It's a container. It comes from an image. There is nothing that can happen in that container outside of like, I don't know, some muons happen to hit the stick of RAM in just the right way to corrupt a piece of memory. And then in large distributed systems, I mean, it's been said many a time, I think Julia Evans even has like a comic about it, but literally like when you get to large scale systems and distributed scale systems, like weird shit just happens. And sometimes it literally is stuff like, well, a muon just happened to hit this RAM stick in the right way to corrupt this sector of RAM in the perfect way to make it do return that it's, you know, lollipops are great or something like that. It, you don't necessarily care about the container. You care about being able to look at what is the log output, what was the metrics output, Metrics are hugely important in these kind of systems. The data is still persisted because you never persist any data inside the container. So if it's something that's fucked up with your, you know, the data inside your database, you've got that there. The only thing you're doing is shooting the MySQL daemon. You aren't shooting the data that lives in there. And that's a good segue into our next slide, how you store data. So. Containers can be shot at any point in time. Where do we store stuff? So Kubernetes allows us to create this concept of a volume or a persistent volume, which is mapped to a pod by a persistent volume claim. Containers within the pod all share the same volumes. So they, if they're mounted into the container, they all look at exactly the same volumes, which is convenient if you need to do something like share a socket. You know, if you want to have something like um, PHP FBM. Sorry. <clears throat> you would put Nginx in a container. You would put PHP FBM in a container you would put PHP into a container. You're running three containers. They talk to each other across sockets. All you do is between these three, you put a single, it's called empty dir, empty directory, which is just a fake volume. Kubernetes just makes up, here's you know, a tempfs that we're going to mount into the containers for them just to have a socket and to be able to share data in between now, they can all talk to each other. Beauty of this is I can update them independently. I don't have to go in and, you know, when there's a new update for Nginx, I don't have to go and say, okay, well, in this container, I need to update Nginx. I can just pull in the new Nginx container that's official and people way smarter than I am who know how to build containers very small, very effectively, very efficiently, have done all of the hard work for me, and I just pull that in and run it. Sadly, the, because of the limitations of Docker Swarm, the official PHP image doesn't do this, but um, that's just because they don't have the concept of pods. They have the concept of a container, and you can't bind the containers together to logically isolate your application, which means that when you run a PHP container, you're actually, instead of starting Nginx, you're running a script that then goes and starts Nginx and PHP and PHP FBM, does all of the coordination so that you can have multiple PIDs running inside this one container, which is horrible and bad. And if you ever run into a situation where you think you need to run more than one PID per container, please, dear God, just come and talk to me. Or Alex, we'll, we'll help you out, because you don't have to. You really don't have to. Sorry, what, what limitation did you put on PHP? No, no limitation on PHP, limitation on Docker Swarm, because they don't have the ability of pods. Ah, Docker Swarm, yeah. yeah. Docker Swarm, 
Docker is fantastic. Docker Swarm was built with the wrong abstractions, which sucks. But we have Kubernetes instead. Ah, so volume and a persistent volume. So volumes are. Yeah, so there's a couple of different kinds of volumes that aren't persistent volumes. So there's things like a host path, where you can say, hey, take this data on the host and mount it into me. This is fantastic for applications where you're running it on every single node. So, you know, uh, I run a proxy on every single node in my cluster to proxy traffic between the nodes. If I need to persist state in that, I can persist that to the node. I don't care which node the container ends up on because it doesn't need specific data for the container. It needs specific data for that node to know how to contact the other nodes, right? So in that case, you can mount in things that are for that particular machine, for that particular host. Um, it's been bastardized a lot and misused to like, hey, let's store things locally on this disk. Um, not the best use case. There's better ways to do that, but it, it is an option. Um, there's a couple of other types of volumes, but persistent volumes tend to be things like if you're running on a cloud provider, whatever the cloud provider offers for block storage, um, alternatively, it's something like Ceph or Gluster or other similar things. So, does that kind of make sense? Cool. Mm. All right, so that's the end of this particular slide deck, or very close to it. There's a lot of other things in Kubernetes that are friggin' fantastic that we have nowhere near enough time to cover. Um, namespaces. Namespaces are possibly the most powerful thing in Kubernetes. They allow you to separate things into their own areas. Most of the clusters I run, mostly because I'm crazy, but Side note, uh, I run dev and production in the same cluster. They run on the same hardware. They're bin packed so that we're using the smallest number of instances possible, which saves us money. But we're able to isolate all of the dev stuff from the production stuff in its entirety just by leveraging namespaces. And if we do want to have specific things talk across namespaces, we can do that. It requires some additional effort to allow cross namespace discussions, we shall call them. But you, you, know, you have this layer of isolation that keeps you separate, but still within the same cluster. You can talk to the same API, and you don't have to differentiate. Um, ingress, layer 7 load balancing, we talked about that a little bit, but awesomeness, because almost everything outside of the cluster, at least in the modern world, we tend to do layer 7 stuff. Unless you're doing something really cool and really fancy, like you happen to work for an email company and you're serving SMTP and POP3 and IMAP, you're going to be doing layer 7 HTTP stuff. So that's the ideal way of getting it into your cluster. Deployments give you, they're a wrapper around pods that you say to a deployment, hey, make stuff happen, and it will go and create the pods for you. So um, jobs, there's two types of jobs. One is run to completion. The other is cron jobs. So you can run them at a particular time, or you can run special workloads. So... Um, Auto-scaling, one of the coolest things in Kubernetes is if you have more work, then you have stuff to do the work. As long as you have machines available, you can add more 
copies of that thing to be able to handle that, that load. Um, and then daemon sets, like I mentioned earlier, if I'm running something like a proxy on every single one of my nodes, I can use a daemon set to do that. So, clear as mud? Cool. Any questions? It's hot, I'm tired, let's go home.